Start in just a second. So, why don't you go ahead and stand? Let's go ahead and sing together. tries to roll over my bones But sorrow comes to steal the joy I own but Brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. She no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the lie. so glad that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. Uh, if you didn't grab communion yet, it's on the side tables, and there's also a table in the back with a basket. You'll grab the communion out of there, and we'll take that together after the sermon today. And uh, go ahead and grab our bulletin, and please fill out the connection card. It really helps us to be able to serve you the best we can. You can rip that out, place it in the offering basket or boxes that are located on the walls as you exit after the service. Go ahead and take a moment to say hi to everyone around you.
what you've done I'm fighting a battle you've already won There's mercy in the waiting There's mercy
You know, I'm going to do something kind of impromptu. I wasn't really planning to do this, but I have a lot of people ask me what this. Go ahead and stop, Gary. Uh, a lot of people ask me what this is for up here, and I just want to give you guys kind of a taste of what it is we listen to every single Sunday. So, Dan, would you mind bringing up the click track a little bit? This is going to be kind of revealing for us. Bridge, That's our work two, every Sunday. Three, four. The reason I showed you that is I just had this thought, you know, it's a wonderful compass. You know, it's we've used it so much that we don't even think about it anymore. That's how we're able to start and stop those songs without you guys even knowing how we did it. So we got this little girl talking in our ear, a little beep going the entire time. And I think a lot about God's word being somewhat like that. It's nice to be able to kind of see where it is you're going. Now, it doesn't give them the entirety of the map of where they're going, but it gives you an idea of where you're going for that moment. And that's why it's so important to be in the Word. Because a lot of us wonder, God, what do you want from me? I think if we just spent some time cracking over that Bible and studying over it, we'd have much more of an indication, at least of what's in front of us, what our next steps are. So, I'll get off my preaching horse and let's go get in worship again. <laughs> Thank you, James.
back to my original thought when I showed you guys the click track about how we have this compass that's showing us where we're going. When I first introduced this back in the day, probably about five years ago, the band really didn't care for it. As you can see, that would get kind of annoying going in your ear right now. But I can stand before you today and say five years later, if I don't put it up here, I'm getting chewed out by the band saying, where is that? We need that. It takes some time. When you dig into that word, it isn't fun right at the beginning. But if you put in the work, it can be an incredible guide to our lives and something you hunger for. So my encouragement to you is to open up that Bible and start reading and don't put it down until you get something out of it every time. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you for the gift of your word. Every Sunday we get to hear a message that comes out of scripture and just... I'm just amazed sometimes about how this message that's been going on for a few thousand years of history is still every bit as relevant in our lives today as it was back then. So God, as we read it, Lord, I just pray that the Holy Spirit is illuminating where it is. We're supposed to follow you more than we already are. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Morning, everyone. Before we continue with our message, um, I want to introduce to you Luke Fangman. Uh, he is the nephew of Brad Fangman, and a couple years ago, we brought him and his wife, Jenna, on as one of the people that we support, and they're working in uh, Japan. And I'm looking all over for Jenna, and I don't see her. Where's she at? Over here. There she is. She's over there, so talk to her. So. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, uh, they, we brought them on in about 2020 or so. Uh, they were supposed to go over, and right about the time that they got scheduled and booked to go, COVID hit, and then it was another year and a half of waiting for the country to open up, and it was a real difficult time for them to, to wait that long. But they've been there now for about 14 months. Uh, they decided to come back on a furlough just to kind of visit some people, visit us, and this was their best opportunity. Um, we thought we could do some other things during the week, but it's just not a good week for that. So we decided to have him come and visit just a few things about what's going on in Japan. So I was just going to ask him a few questions. Uh, they've been here for about 12 months. Um, in that 12 months, what stands out as kind of the biggest cultural shift between what you know in the United States and what you've had to learn? Yeah, I think uh, living in Japan, right, and it's very different. Um, if I had to pick one word to describe the difference, I would say that Japan is very quiet. Japan is very, very quiet. Uh, we've lived in a pretty dense city with about a million and a half other people. Uh, but life in Japan is kind of like a really well-oiled machine. So there's a whole bunch of people, but things are pretty smooth. Uh, so in Japan, people don't really prioritize individual freedom in the way that American culture does. Um, and instead, most people are motivated by wanting to keep the peace, keep the harmony with everybody else around. Uh, so, you know, trains, buses are going to be crammed full of people, but they're almost dead silent all the time. Uh, so on the flip side of that, right, staying... Um, trying not to cause problems for people also leads to people really living isolated lives. So relationships can be pretty slow. That can be tough. Um, I, I think with that, one of the best witnesses that we can give to Jesus actually as, as the church is to be a loving community, to invite people in and to care about people in a way that doesn't fit the traditional Japanese mold. Um, so I think there's a big opportunity there just introducing people to, to freedom in Christ. And so what you're saying is you're going there to make noise. <laughs> Making noise. <laughs> Just Praise kidding. the Lord. <laughs> uh, and moving over to Japan, obviously they speak Japanese, um, and the language is a big issue. Um, what have you done to kind of conquer that, and then what have you, what do you do to kind of use that as a tool to outreach? Yeah, so um, there's kind of three different aspects of our language study that we've participated in so far. We go to language classes. Uh, you think, think five. Five to 15 students, probably, uh, you just imagine a classroom with a whole bunch of characters on the whiteboard. It's about what you would think it is. It's pretty tough. Um, we also meet with language tutors, uh, so professional teachers who are helping us um, with a lot of conversation practice and also, you know, focusing on grammar points or vocabulary that we're struggling with. Um, and then also some self-study. That's the third thing. 
uh, that we've done, just ways to memorize the characters and remember what you know meaning and pronunciation is and stuff. It, it's tough. There's three alphabets in Japanese, so it's it's tough to keep it all straight. But uh, as far as ministry-wise, our church uh, actually does services bilingually, so English and Japanese. We found that more Japanese people show up when it's that way. That's just what God's doing right now, um, and and I think. You know, a big aspect of, of language exchange and being language students is that we get to connect with a whole bunch of people who want to learn English, uh, and I'll talk about it in a minute, but it gets, creates opportunities for sharing the gospel with people. So, yeah. So, I don't know if you heard that. Three alphabets. I would not be a good student. <laughs> okay. Uh, and you started in Sendai. That's where we originally agreed that you were going to go, and that's where you are going to work at, and you've done that for the last 14 months. Um, but you have also said that there's been a shift in that goal, and now you're being moved to Kyoto. What, what What's the reason for the change, and what do you expect to do there? Yeah, so within our network, it's actually pretty common between language school and coming on staff with a church plant uh, to change locations or basically see where needs are in the network. Uh, in our case, it is a little bit unique. One, because we're getting ready to have a baby, and so we're looking for a place to settle down uh, a little earlier than maybe we would have otherwise. And uh, there's some people moving around the network, people coming back to the states, different things. And so after a bunch of conversations with some of our leaders, uh, it seemed like a good idea to uh, have us go ahead and transfer now a little bit earlier than we would have planned to. Uh, Kyoto, uh, just a couple months ago, became the first mustard seed Christian church uh, with a Japanese pastor. Uh, and so part of this leadership transition uh, is, is a really good opportunity for us to come alongside and, and help and support. Uh, his name is Shin Yoshida. Uh, so we can come and help and support him and learn from him as we really try to turn that corner from foreigners and missionaries doing things to more local leaders. Um, so you can pray for us in that, and uh, we'll be coming on to support them in equipping the church, equipping the saints for ministry. Uh, one specific area that Sheen's told me that I'll probably be working on is in the kind of community justice mercy area. So equipping the church to uh, be a blessing to the community, to the city, um, through uh, advocating for adoption, foster care, uh, maybe food pantry, community service, those kinds of things, uh, and the needs that we find there um, in Kyoto. Uh, you know, Jesus saw the crowds, they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd, and he had compassion on them, and we want to show that same compassion to the city of Kyoto and to Japan. And so you've gone through a lot of transition, that year and a half of waiting, a year of getting there and getting settled in the job that you're doing, now you're expecting a baby, but now you have to transition again to Kyoto. Um, so just to kind of give us a sense of relationships, what have you, uh, give us a couple examples of people that you've been able to meet and connect with. Um, so that can set you as an encouragement for what you do in Kyoto. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one uh, I'll mention is Yuko. Uh, Yuko is a Japanese mother of two, and she's an English teacher at a Japanese grade school. Uh, Yuko was invited to our English practice conversation group by a friend, uh, and she's been coming for a good portion of the last year. I guess we didn't scare her away. Uh, and actually, after an English Connect gathering, one Tuesday evening, uh, she told me that she had never heard why the cross was so important for Christians. She'd never heard what the cross was about. She'd seen like cross necklaces, but that was it. Uh, and, and so it was in that conversation that Yuko was the first person, first Japanese person that I got to share the gospel with. Now, I, I wish I could tell you that she's now uh, been baptized and become a follower of Jesus. Uh, she is not yet but we haven't scared her off. She's still around. Her kids are around. We've been hanging out. We got to celebrate New Year's with them. Um, you know, I'm hopeful to hear that she comes to faith soon. Uh, one other person I'll mention is named Taka, a young man about my age. Uh, he's a chef, and his dream is to move to Brooklyn, New York, and open a Japanese restaurant there. So maybe he'll get there. I don't know. Um, I actually met Taka on a language exchange application called Tandem, uh, and he started coming to English Connect as well. Uh, and, and at a coffee shop on one of his days off, uh, through very broken Japanese and some written resources and honestly Google Translate, uh, I got to introduce him to the gospel for the first time as well. Uh, and, and, you know, Taka also, he's not become a Christian yet. He's closer than he was. And uh, I, I'm thankful he's continued to get more connected with people in the church who I trust can share uh, the love of Jesus with him. And so I'm hopeful, hopeful for him as well. Um, it's for Yuko, it's for 
Taka and, and many others that we're in Japan. Uh, for the roughly 100 million people who live in Japan who've never once heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, we want them to be able to hear uh, so that they might have uh, faith through hearing uh, in, in Jesus and be saved. So if I can, I would just want to say thank you. Thank you, Crossroads Christian Church, for your prayers, uh, for your investment in Mustard Seed Network and in us. Uh, God's been very good to us, very gracious to us, uh, and he's teaching us, he's sanctifying us, and he's drawing people to himself in Japan in, in some really amazing ways. Uh, actually, God has provided uh, for, at this time, seven churches to be started through Mustard Seed Network in Japan, uh, and there's two more currently in the works, so please be continuing to pray for that. Uh, praise God for what he's doing, and, and we're just, you know, we are thankful <laughs> that by the grace of God we get to be a part of it. Uh, we look forward to what he has in store moving forward. Well, we're going to pray for him in just a second, but I want to remind you, there's a, the number one principle in evangelism and outreach to people is don't scare them off. <laughs> And they've been successful so far. So we want to give you an opportunity. They're not going to be able to visit for very long, but they are going to be out in the hallway uh, over at the entryway and the, at the table. Please stop by there if you have any thoughts or questions that came up while he was talking and, uh, and visit with them and let them know about or let him tell you about some of the things that's going on in Japan. Uh, let's pray for them, and then uh, we'll continue on in our service. Dear Laura, thank you so much for the the effort and the time and energy that Luke and Jenna have put into going into Japan and the transitions, the willingness to struggle with language and culture, uh, the opportunity that has been given to them and also to the, uh, the need for reaching out um, to the people of Japan to help them know about you. I just pray that you would help them as they uh, are uh, continuing through this month to visit here, keep them safe, keep them uh, energized. And when they return as they transition to the city of Kyoto, I pray that you would help them to find housing quickly, to um, meet people well, and to serve the church and the people of Kyoto well. Thank you for all that you do for them and for us and for the people of Japan. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. Quick poll, would you rather me be standing here or just be on the screens? Because I had somebody at 8 o'clock go, we just want to see you on the screen from now on. Can you just stay gone? Like, He was very adamant. He claimed he spoke for half the room up there. Um, but um, yeah, good to be back with you all this morning. Uh, appreciate the prayers for the group that was in Israel. By the way, I just want to say this. With, when we're done here in a few minutes, when the window opens for the donuts... If somebody just comes shoving you out of the way to get to the front of the line, they probably were on the trip with us. Because that's how you operate over there. There's no lines. There's no order. You just go get what you want when you want to get it. In fact, we were at a, at a place where they make olive oil. And uh, the guy said, uh, I can tell you're Americans because you're being patient. I'm like, I think that's more about being Midwesterners. But, you know, he's, he's like, if you want to be Israelis, you've got to knock people out of your way and yell, yell at them. So... Uh, hopefully, some people brought their air horns from the trip because you're supposed to blow, blow your air horn when somebody cuts you off and knock him out of the way and go get your donut. But hey, we're glad that you're with us uh, today. It was a good trip to answer the two questions everybody's asked me. Yes, it was a great trip. No, I have not recovered. So this is the two questions everybody's asked. Uh, I've been awake at about 4 a.m., a couple of mornings ready for lunch. And um, so, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Just said, if I can make it through this one, then, then there'll be a recording. They can show the 1045 service, and if I fall off the stage, then at least they've got a sermon to watch, right? Hey, I got a question as we get ready to jump in this morning. Uh, how many of you remember what life was like when you were 17 years old? I know, some of you have to think about this a little harder than some of the rest of us. I get that, okay? I'm sorry, I'm not trying to rack your brain this morning, but how many of you can remember life at 17 years old? Specifically, how many of you remember what you wanted life to be like when you were 17 years old? You had your world planned. You had everything laid out in front of you. You knew how you wanted it to be. How many of you can remember that? Okay? I can think back to mine very vividly, and in fact, I, I thought I'd even be uh, kind of kind to you this morning and show you what I looked like when I was 17 years old. Uh, I'm sure you're going to love that. In, in all honesty, I might have just turned 18 there. Those were going into my senior year of high school. I had those pictures taken, 
But yeah, back when I got shirts in a large for some reason and thought it was cool to wear a necklace all the time, and um, yeah, that was, that was uh, God's gift to the world right there in, in 17-year-old Kurt. Uh, go, get, get that off there. We've done it. We've looked at it enough. So, but uh, at 17 years old, I had my life planned. You know, I, I wanted to go do broadcasting. I wanted to be uh, doing baseball or football games on TV or the radio every night. I had my future planned. I was going to go to college. I was going to meet my wife while I was in college and get married coming out of college and start having kids at 25 and be done having kids at 30. And uh, I think I've told you my firstborn was born the day after I turned 30. You know, God's like, okay, cool story. Here's what we're going to do instead. And, uh, you know, life changes. How many of you, your life is exactly how it is today as you had it planned at 17 years old? I'll kind of come back to why we're talking about that here in just a moment. But for many of us, we plan life from kind of a point A to point B, and and our thoughts is that it's going to look like this. Yeah, we know maybe there's going to be a little bit of a turn here or a bend there or a little bit of a mountaintop here or a valley there, but, but we don't expect life to just get off the rails. But in reality, our life actually looks more like this, right? And maybe those curves are even bigger, the dips are are wider, they last longer, we get stuck longer, maybe we have a a mountaintop experience that lasts a long time and it's great and kind of gives us this false pretense that nothing's ever going to go wrong again. That's what life often feels like. Often, though, life comes our way in the form of a detour. We get detours thrown our direction all the time. In fact, the detour is defined like this. It's a deviation from a direct course or the usual procedure. Now, what do we think of when we think of detours? You probably automatically think of driving somewhere, right? And you see that orange sign, and you've got to change direction. Like for me, I like to hop on 435 and go south to K10 and go west a couple miles to Woodland and Woodland south a mile to college and then eventually get close to my neighborhood. But there's some days that one of those roads is closed, and I've got to go all the way down Renner, or I've got to take Johnson all the way out to K7, and, you know, it adds a couple of minutes. Well, that's a detour, right? We're used to those. They are usually inconvenient at best, and at worst, they're just downright infuriating. But we know what detours in life are really like. It's not just getting behind the wheel and having to drive a different direction. Detours in life are things like maybe you lost your job. And now the plans you've got in front of you have to stop or change. Or, or maybe you lost somebody in your life through a relationship breakup. Or maybe, maybe somebody passed away. And suddenly those, those things that you thought life was going to bring haven't. Or, or maybe, maybe you've got a diagnosis. You, you've been battling sickness or an injury. And it's not just altered where you're at now, but moving forward, things are going to have to change. Maybe one of your kids got a diagnosis that's knocked you off of your, your path. We have detours that come our way, and many of you may be facing one right now. You might be in the middle of one right now. I'd say the one thing that we all have in common is we're going to face a detour, whether you currently are, you just got out of one, or maybe there's one waiting for you down the road shortly. The question is, what do we do about it? Often when we're in a detour, what we like to do is start asking questions about how can we get out of this and try to figure out our way out of this. But let me ask you a question instead. What if we started looking at our detours in life differently? What if we started facing them differently rather than, than defining detour literally like this straight out of the dictionary? What if we started to define detour biblically? Or maybe, maybe a better way to say it is define it spiritually. I think maybe we could define it like this. A detour is a change in our plans God uses to develop character and complacency so we can arrive at a better destination. But this has one one major condition. God can only do this if we let him. If we let him into our lives, if we let him take the wheel, if we let him guide us into the decisions that every detour brings us to. Uh, We're starting a new series today uh, called Detours and Decisions, and what we're going to do is spend eight weeks uh, looking at one of the most major characters in the Old Testament, a guy by the name of Joseph. Joseph's story is actually pretty remarkable. I didn't realize this until I stopped and looked at it. Joseph has more coverage, more airtime in the book of Genesis than any other character. He's got more than Adam and Eve. He's got more than Noah. He has more even than his great-grandfather Abraham. He's got more than his father and grandfather combined. 
That's how important Joseph's story is for us. And just to kind of set this up, to kind of lead you into this, maybe you're not real familiar with it. We're going to be in in Genesis chapter 37 here in a minute if you want to turn there. But to kind of set up who Joseph is, in Genesis 12, we meet a man named Abraham. At At the time, he's called Abram. But Abraham is called by God to leave his homeland and leave everything that he knows and go someplace that he's never been, a foreign land, and trust God. That's basically what he's tasked with. And he said, despite the fact that you're like 100 years old, you know, I'm going to bless you with children and, and you're going to have this great nation come from you and the Messiah is eventually going to come from you. And, and so through trusting God, eventually Abraham and his wife Sarah have a son named Isaac. And Isaac grows up and, and he marries a woman named Rebekah and they have twin sons and, uh, named Esau and Jacob. And Jacob is the one that gets the birthright from Isaac. And Jacob goes out to meet a woman named Rachel, and that's who Joseph's mom is. That kind of sets up our story of the four generations of the patriarchs we read about in the book of Genesis. But what I want to do today as we look at Joseph's story is I picked his story because it's, it's a relatable story. Now, maybe not in the literal things that came Joseph's way, but in the ways that he was, was given options to react how he could respond to things, that's where we start to see some similarities here. So what I want to do is just kind of read through the story. We're going to pause and make some observations on the text and then come back later and kind of set this up because Genesis 37 really just sets up Joseph's story. We, we start with him as a teenager. We end with him being sold into captivity. And then the rest of the book of Genesis follows his story, follows the decisions that he has to make, follows the various detours life throws his way. I just want to today read through his story and then talk a bit about what detours in life mean to kind of set up the rest of this series that we're going to unpack over the next seven weeks and look at that. So Genesis 37, starting in verse 2, it says, At 17 years of age, Joseph tended sheep with his brothers. The young man was working with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. Press pause, and let's make our first observation. What do we learn about Joseph right here? Just look at the last line. Two women, both of them are his father's wives. He comes from a messy family. Okay, that's the first thing we can learn about Joseph. Now, his whole story kind of goes like this, and I'll try to sum this up quickly. His father, Jacob, went out to find a wife. He met this beautiful woman named Rachel. He fell in love with her. He wanted to marry her. Her father says, come work for me for seven years, and you can have her. He does that, and then he gets the bait and switch, and instead he goes, you know, actually, you've got to marry my oldest daughter, Leah, first. You know, the one that's not very attractive? I can't find a man for her. She's yours now. That's what his father does to Jacob. Oh, and work another seven years, and then you can have Rachel too. Fourteen years, two wives, both sisters. I don't have personal experience with this. You know, I, I'm married to one woman. I don't know how I could handle also being married to one of her sisters, okay? I love them dearly. Don't want them in my home, okay? Like, you get the point, right? I just imagine the friction that would come, the jealousy that would come, and that's what happens. God blesses Leah because she's not the chosen one from from Jacob, so he blesses her by giving her children. She has four sons. Rachel can't have any. So Rachel is jealous and gives Jacob her servant. She has two sons. Leah is now past the age of children. She's jealous, gives him his or her servant. Two more sons. If you're keeping track, that's eight so far by three women. God blesses Leah again. Two more. We've had ten sons, none by his chosen wife, Rachel. Finally, she gives birth to Joseph. And then to make it even worse for Joseph, he's number 11 in line. This is a patriarchal society, so you go by birth order, right? He's number 11. She has one more child and dies in childbirth. So he loses his mother. He's left with three stepmoms who probably look at him with a little bit of disdain because Joseph loves him more than he loves their children. Got it? Okay. Messy family. That's the first thing we learn here about Jacob, or about Joseph. Number two, we learn this. It says at the end of verse two, while he's out there tending sheep, it says, and he brought a bad report about his brothers to his father. So what's the second thing we learn about Joseph? He's a tattletale, right? How many of you had or, or do have the bratty little brother or sister that was a tattletale and let your parents know everything you did wrong? How many of you were the bratty little brother or sister to let your parents know? Yeah, there's a lot more, a lot more little siblings in here. I've got one brother. He's four years younger than me. He was my Joseph. 
He told my parents everything I did and a bunch of things I didn't do that I got in trouble for. And I'll never forget this. One of the absolute best days of my entire life, I was 11 years old, when something was broken and we're getting in trouble and Cade's telling my dad it was all my fault. My dad finally looked at both of us and goes, you know what, I'm going to believe Kurt this time. Best day of my life. (laughs) And the best part was I actually had done it that time. (laughs) Like I was the one that should have gotten in trouble for it. But he believed me over, over Cade and I was like, yes. Finally, he's no longer the favorite. Finally, he's no longer the chosen one, right? Now, whatever it was, Joseph sent, or Jacob sent Joseph to kind of spy on his brothers, to come back and bring their report. You'd think this would be the job of the oldest brother, Reuben, right? But no, it's number 11 out of 12 here. Verse 3, Jacob loved Joseph more than his, uh, any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. I'm going to add something to this. I think, too, he was his favorite because he was born to his chosen wife. He was born to Rachel, the woman he truly loved and who struggled for years to have a child. I think that plays into it a little bit as well, too, there. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. You probably read this in some translations as a a coat of many colors or Maybe the amazing Technicolor dream code. I'm not sure how you're thinking this. But this translates from the Hebrew to mean this ornate garment. And, and yes, it was colorful, but it also has to do with how it was constructed and what it was made from. It was made from the finest materials, and it was, it was constructed with the absolute top level of embroidery and, and, and craftsmanship. I mean, this was not just something you would get, you know, your 17-year-old son. This was something that royalty might wear. This was something that somebody of prestige might wear. And guess who dad bought it for? Number 11, the bratty little brother, right? Like he's shopping for the rest of the kids at at Goodwill, and he's going to Bergdorf Goodman for, for Joseph here. He's getting them the top of the line. And I just have a feeling, if he's getting Joseph this robe, he's also giving Joseph a lot of other things he's not giving the brothers as well too. Verse four, but his brothers hated him. This took a turn suddenly, didn't it? They hated him because their father loved him more than the rest of them. We look at Joseph, I think, at times, and we picture him as we see him through the rest of his story. And and as we see the rest of the the story, the rest of the series, we're going to see Joseph become this amazing, upstanding man who did things right time and time again. But that's not who we're talking about today. We're not talking about grown man Joseph. We're talking about 17-year-old Joseph. And I just have this idea of who 17-year-old Joseph might be. Just from what we've read so far in three or four verses, I picture this 17-year-old Joseph to be an entitled, spoiled, arrogant brat. That's kind of who it comes off as. And we know this because as we read more down in the story, we know that, that Jacob sends the other brothers out to go tend the sheep and lets Joseph stay at home. He's 17. He's old enough to be out there working in the fields with them, but he gets to stay back. And then when he does send him, he sends him to go check and make sure they're doing their job. Yeah, I kind of think if I was one of the older brothers, I would start to develop a little bit of of an issue with him too. I just remember back to me being 17. And I think a lot about what what 17-year-old Kurt was like, what that devilishly handsome young man you saw out there was like. (laughs) God's gift to the world, right? How many of you at 17 probably thought the same thing? Joseph, Joseph has it all. But yet what we see is it's his brothers that his father sends over 50 miles away, clear up to a place called Shechem to go tend the sheep. And then he sends Joseph to go after them to make sure they're doing their job. You think if you were one of those older brothers, you might have a problem or two with him. Verse 17, it says, Joseph went out after his brothers and found them near Dothan. That's another 15 miles further away from where they were tending the sheep. And when they saw him in the distance, before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. I don't know exactly what all Joseph's done here. But just kind of putting this all together and, and using a little bit of conjecture on this, man, how much has he pushed them? that they've built up so much hatred in their heart, they're ready to kill him. Like, you've got to have a lot of hatred in your heart to kill, period. But this is their own flesh and blood. This is their brother that they want to kill here. Thankfully for Joseph, his oldest brother, Reuben, intervenes and says, no, we're not going to kill him. We'll, 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 
We're not, we can't kill him. And it says Reuben actually wanted to take him back to his father. I kind of wonder if Reuben's wanting to do this for his own gain. Take him back and say, hey, I rescued, I rescued your baby. I rescued your most precious child. You know, you should probably think a little higher of me now. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But what we know is over the course of time, while Reuben keeps him safe, while Reuben's trying to take care of some things, the other brothers develop a plan just to get rid of him anyway. It says in verse 23, Joseph came to his brothers, and when he did, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and they threw him into a cistern. Threw him into a, basically a big concrete hole in the ground to do what with? Kind of to hold him until they figured out something better. They see some Ishmaelites passing by. Those were distant cousins of theirs, some, some kind of nomads passing through, traders. And they sell him to these traders who take him to Egypt, and they sell him into slavery. And that's how chapter 37 ends. That's where we'll pick Joseph's story up next week, being sold to a man named Potiphar, who was the captain of Pharaoh's guard in Egypt. And we'll read more about that there. But we look at this story, and, and we look at what we're going to cover over the next seven weeks what we're going to see is how Joseph is faced with one detour in life after another and how he navigated those and made decisions, ultimately decisions that would honor God. And the reason we're looking at this is because I think often in life we're going to face very similar moments. We're going to face very similar detours, very similar decisions that we have to make in life. No, you might not face the exact same situation that Joseph faced. But you might face one where you're forced to make a decision that if you say no to it, it's going to hurt you. But if you say yes to it, it's going to make you sacrifice your integrity. Or maybe you're going to catch yourself in a place like a prison. Maybe not a literal prison like he was in, but a, a spiritual prison or, or an emotional prison. And you've got to figure out a way to find joy and hope or wallow in your own self-pity. Or maybe you find a time in life where you get some kind of promotion that you definitely know you earned. And you deserved it. And you got it. And you've got to decide how to respond to that. With pride? With arrogance? Or, or can you do it with humility? Or maybe you face one of the hardest decisions of all. Somebody's hurt you. And you've got the opportunity to strike back. And you get to decide, do I want to do that or do I want to forgive? Those are the types of detours and decisions that Joseph faced that we're going to break down over the next several weeks. I want to encourage you to make it a point to be here over these next seven weeks as we look through this story. What I want to do today, though, is instead of diving into any one of those, is just talk about what detours in life are like. Because, again, like I said, the one thing I think we all have in common is we face detours. Maybe you're stuck in one right now. I've been in several over the last several years. Sometimes they don't last very long. Sometimes... Man, they seem like they never stop. It seems hopeless. It seems like we can't get out of it. So what do they mean in life? What, what are the detours we face? What are they all about? How can we focus on and honor God through them? I just want to answer those with the time we have left today. Because I think it will help us understand Joseph's path through the rest of his story and what we can do with it in our own lives. So here's number one. I think detours are often caused in life by three things. Maybe there's some others, but I think you can do some three umbrella terms here that will help us understand what detours are caused by. The first, detours are caused by our own bad choices. This might be the most obvious, right? You do something dumb, you get to live with the results of that, right? Maybe they're a decision that we made you know, intentionally. You know, I don't care, I'll ask for forgiveness later. We'll just go with it. Maybe it's one we made, you know, we kind of fell into didn't really mean for it to happen, but we didn't protect ourselves and it happened anyway. Maybe it was one that you kind of did, it was innocent enough, but you weren't paying enough attention and, and you got yourself into trouble. Often, our own bad choices, and, and we can sometimes reconcile that because we ultimately know it comes back on us, right? Number two, they can be caused by other people's choices. Other people's choices and how they affect us. There are many times that you're an innocent bystander. How many children have seen their parents divorce? And that's a detour in their lives. And they had nothing to do with it, but that's the reality of the situation now. Or maybe, maybe, maybe something happened with a job. And it wasn't your, your choice, wasn't your decision, but that's what the employer decided to do, and you're the one that gets affected by it. Number three, and this might be the hardest one for us to kind of wrap our minds around. Sometimes detours are caused by God's divine plan simply redirecting us. 
This one, I think, can be the hardest to understand and therefore be the most frustrating to deal with. And I want to camp out on this one for a minute because of that very reason. Uh, Often we get into this situation, and I think our natural reaction, anytime there's a detour, is to go to number two. I think that's where we go because it's just easier for it to be somebody else's fault. And let me just tell you, from my own experience, that's where I automatically go is I automatically figure out a way I can point the finger at somebody else because, you know what, I'm pretty sure I did what I was supposed to do there. Sometimes it's not one or two, it's three. And sometimes when we're stuck in three, we still look at number two. We still look at at other people at fault here. And we lose sight of of God's big plan and all this. Maybe it's one and two together, but ultimately three is the one that, that encompasses all of it. That's Joseph's situation here. I think Joseph, you kind of had all three of them at play. I think his own decisions that he made as a teenager pushed his brothers to dislike him and hate him. Ultimately, it was their decision to reject him and, and get rid of him. But we know from Joseph's story that he looks at it at the end, like this is what God wanted all along. In fact, he says that at the end of his story in Genesis 50, he tells his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. And I think this is why sometimes it's hard for us to wrap our minds around this. Again, one of our biggest issues I think that we have in our culture is playing the blame game. It's so much easier to play the victim card than it is to either own up to our own mistakes or seek what God really wants for us in the middle of all of this. And I'm just going to tell you, folks, I'm going to ask you the question right now, and I'll I'll just start right at you. If you're currently playing the victim card, how long are you going to do it? How long are you going to play the victim? Even if you're the innocent bystander and all this, how long are you going to continue to do that? Because let me just say this, the longer you play the victim card, the longer it's going to be until you can let go and allow God to show you his big plan in all of this. Romans chapter 8, Paul is in the middle of one of, I think, one of the most powerful and impactful chapters in all of Scripture. And as he starts to wrap up this chapter, he says in Romans 8, verse 28, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Verse 31, he goes on to say, what shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And then in verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, he says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. You know what you can't be if you're a conqueror? You can't be a victim. You can't do them simultaneously. Try it. See if it works. The longer you're blaming others and blaming yourself and blaming God, the longer it's going to be until you can allow Jesus to help you become a conqueror in life and to conquer what's around you. He wraps up the chapter like this, For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present or the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth, I love this, or anything else in all creation. Paul could have just said, literally nothing can separate you from the love of of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. But often we want to cling to those things. We want to cling to all those things that he just listed there. We want to cling to those things that hold us back. Why? Because it's easier to play the victim card sometimes. Let me ask you a question, church. Don't you think it's time to stop playing the victim card and instead start playing the victor card? Let go and let Christ in. Let him take hold and claim your victory through him. Live it through him. Number two thing that we learn from detours is that God will use a detour to develop you. That's why it's important to let go. This is one that's one of the harder ones to understand. Why? Because too often we think that we've got it all figured out already. What do I need to be developed on? God, you've already given me all these gifts. Joseph probably thought that again. What is he at 17 years old? He's bratty. He's entitled. He's boastful. I'm assuming he's probably arrogant too. You know what I was at 17 years old? I was bratty. I was spoiled. I was entitled. I would know I was arrogant. And I let everybody know how good I was at stuff. You kind of heard some of my story with getting out of college and and being destined for the broadcast booth for ESPN or for whatever network was going to be honored to have me, right? And I'll be honest, I was good at it. I was good at what I did. And I made sure everybody else knew it too. 
I didn't have the connections that some of the guys I went to school with. My dad didn't work for ESP and like one of the guys I went to college with. I wasn't willing to, to kiss up and play that game like some of the other guys were. So I made sure they knew what I could do. Here's the problem when you're that age. Yeah, you might know what you're good at, but you don't know what you're not. And maybe, just maybe, that's the most important thing. Because the, the younger you are, the more you don't know what you don't know. The older you get, you can look back and go, man, I was not very bright. <laughs> what, well, that's what life does. Life shows us things. It reveals things to us. And, and man, I, I needed that time to be developed by God. I needed that time to, to go through what I call my desert experience. It was not fun. And many times I had many conversations with God that were very one-sided. God might have been talking back to me, but I wasn't, wasn't listening if he was because I needed him to hear me. I needed him to know what I was trying to say. Little did I know what was going on in my own heart and life at the time. That God needed to tell you, Kurt, you've got you to, number one, be patient. Slow down. You're not in control. Number two, yeah, you might be good at some things, but you're not the greatest thing of all time. You need to be humbled. And remember your place in all of this. Because, yeah, you might be good at these things, but these things over here you're not, and you've got to find people who are. Or learn to grow in those positions. That's one of the hardest words we can focus on, isn't it? Growth. Because what's growth mean? Growth is usually accompanied by pain. In fact, I'd say it like this. You can have growth or you can have comfort. But you don't often get both. You can have growth or you can have comfort, but you'll rarely grow when you're comfortable. How many times have you wanted to go get in better physical shape, whether that's lifting weights or jogging or running or whatever it takes to get stronger, to get, you know, feel better, have better cardiovascular health, and the best thing you can do is lay on the couch watching TV. It doesn't work that way, right? Or you say, man, I'd love to know more. I'd love to dive deeper into to learn more about God or about some other topic. So I'm going to I'm going to watch The Office. What have you got to do? You've got to dive into something and study. You've got to dive into things that might be hard to understand because you're trying to stretch and grow. You can have comfort or growth, but you can't have them both at the same time. Here's why. Number three thing about detours. Detours will take you to a destination God wanted, but you never would have arrived at on your own. Again, go back to my story here just a little bit. I was in that humbling experience, and I knew what I wanted. And I'll be honest, I probably would still enjoy that life. But that's not where God wanted me. God wanted me here. And so what did God do? He led me through one trial after another. He, he opened a door for me to go teach and learn how to formulate thoughts. I, I had the ability to communicate. I needed to know how to formulate it into kind of a point A to point B coherent lesson, and then to Bible college so I could learn what it was I was supposed to teach, and then into a residency program so I could learn how to handle and absorb problems and problem solve and, and ask questions when things aren't working. And then he led me to a church that welcomed us in and, and got my feet wet in ministry, but also learned how to deal with some people who could be difficult at times. And I learned in the process of how to handle criticism. That was not a fun lesson for me to learn because some of that criticism wasn't fair and it wasn't fun and some of it got very personal, especially for my wife. But we learned how to handle it. And ultimately, God brought us through all of those trials and, and, and through the last couple of years of, man, just everything that COVID threw our way, which we had a little bit of a... COVID flashback this week, because when I was doing the sermon on the, on the lake last week, it was just me plus one person there, the driver that I had that was taking me everywhere. We didn't realize at the time, or I did, but the rest of the group didn't. They were like 50 yards away from me. They didn't know it, like just, just on the other side of the water. But me plus a driver preaching to a camera, I'm like, man, this brings back memories. <laughs> but one trial after another ultimately leading me to a place that I had no idea God was bringing me to. And I, I said this at 8 o'clock, I don't know what my life would have been like if it would have gone to plan at 17 years old. Now, I have a feeling, yeah, I would be doing baseball games or football games on, on TV. You'd hear me when you watch it instead of some of the other broadcasters, and I probably would be loving that. But would I be leading people to Christ if that, that life worked out? 
I don't know. Would I be walking with Christ if that life worked out? I, I like to think I would, but I don't know. Because I was chasing what? I was chasing that instead of chasing God. I was chasing what I wanted, chasing my hopes, my dreams, all of that. Sometimes in life, to get where God's leading you is not an easy journey. Hardships will be endured. And some of you are walking through some of those right now. But you need to understand something. The question we often ask is why? Why are you leading me through this? Why am I stuck in the middle of this? And that's a question that we have to ask and be okay not getting an answer to. Because here's our number four observation. This is maybe the hardest one to accept. Detours are almost never pain-free. Just like when you go to work out, often your body hurts the next day. Often you don't feel well, maybe for a day or two. There's pain when you stretch. There's pain when you grow. I uh, watch my kids, you know, complain, my leg hurts, my knees hurt. I'm like, that oh, means you're growing. <laughs> when I was in eighth grade, I shot up six inches. I actually outgrew my body for a stretch. I went from like 5'2 to 5'8 in the span of a couple months, my bones grew faster than my ligaments and it actually pulled a piece of my, my bone loose for a while. Painful. That's growth, right? You remember this maybe when you were younger. That's how life works. Growing is almost always gonna involve some pain. When we grow in knowledge, it requires maybe some long nights of study. When we grow as a church, we, we tell you all the time, we want you to step out of your comfort zones. Do things that are uncomfortable. Make yourself vulnerable. It might hurt, but there's growth there for you, not just the person you're trying to reach. Growth requires hardship. It requires us to go this direction. The question is, are you willing to do it? Are you willing, are you willing to endure what comes with it? To endure that detour and to trust God to bring you through it. This is where we realize most people aren't. Look how John Maxwell said it. He said, most people have uphill hopes and downhill habits. They want God to do big things in their life, but they're not willing to trust him enough to endure what it takes to get there. Let me ask you, church, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to trust the one who is always faithful, who won't leave you and won't forsake you, even if you're stuck in a detour and you don't know exactly where it's going to let you out. You ever gone through that? Maybe before the days of maps on our phones or GPS, when you're on a detour and you're not 100% sure where it's going to let you out, you're just hoping it's a place you recognize or a place you can get back to where you're going quickly. Maybe just maybe that detour is taking you to a place you were supposed to be all along. What I do know is this, not knowing where that detour is going to take you or how long it's going to take you, I know this, God will be with you through the whole thing, if you let him. The writer of Hebrews says it like this, let us hold to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. So I just want to leave you with a couple of questions today. Whether you're in a detour right now, or you just got out of one, or maybe they're just questions you can file away for next time you're stuck in one. Here's the first question. What is God teaching you from your current or past detours? What is it that God wants to show you? Because when you're stuck in the middle, sometimes it's hard to see that unless you start thinking through God. I look back at mine, I had no idea what he was trying to teach me in the middle of it. And I remember telling Jennifer, if he would just tell me, I'd get it. Looking back, it's starting to become more obvious. I don't have all my answers yet, but I'm starting to get something. So ask the question, what is it that he's teaching you? If you've endured one, what did he want you to know? And here's number two. How would you think or act differently if you leveraged your detour for good instead of constantly fighting it? Because this might be the hardest one of all. When we're in a detour, what do we want to do? Get out of it. Fighting it, talking our way out of it, praying our way out of it. Maybe you're in the detour for a reason. Maybe you're in a detour because God needs to shape you and mold you just a little bit more those two that one of these days you're going to come across somebody who's fighting the same battle. So how would it be different if you leveraged it for good? And instead of praying, God, get me out of this mess, you pray, God, show me what it is. Show me what it is that I can use this for good. One of the hardest prayers to pray. Let's be fed, uh, look forward into this series. 
and see how Joseph navigated those, those detours in life, we see that Joseph made the right decision every time. And sometimes for us, when we're stuck in the middle of a detour, that's when the wrong decisions fly. But that's my hope, is that we, we learn to trust God through this. Here's a takeaway, and this is, this is for you, especially if you're stuck in one today. If you're in the middle of a detour, understand that God is not finished with you. Sometimes it's easy to think if you're in the middle of one. And I'll tell you, the last major detour I was in, I was starting to question, God, is this really what you want me to do with my life? Because if it is, you need to open a door pretty fast. Because if I have to hang on and endure this much longer, I might do something else. Because maybe this is your sign, I'm not supposed to be doing this. He wasn't finished with me. He's not finished with you. There's still work to be done. Trust him. Lean into him. And pray ask him, how can I use this for your kingdom, for good? Father, we're so grateful for your son. God, we're so grateful that that we have these moments to look at back in scripture. These moments to look at, these, these heroes of the faith to look at, to know that they were men and women just like we are. They were flawed like we are, but time and time again, even in the midst of some bad decisions, they stayed true to you. Pray as we look at the life of Joseph, that anybody who's facing trials, facing tribulations in life, Lord, you would remind them of who you are and you would remind them that you will never leave them, you will never forsake them. God, we pray for everybody in this room today. In the midst of all of it, we can be a light for you, shining for you, leading people. take this, I just kind of want to reflect back for a moment on our last couple of weeks. Uh, one of the last things that we did, in fact, it was the end of our tour, so to speak, was we went to the garden too, which is probably not exactly where Jesus was crucified and, and buried, but it's, it's a good reminder of that. And it shows us what it might have looked like. It's a very peaceful, serene place in the middle of one of the most chaotic cities on the globe. But as we're sitting there, uh, tour leader Brent taught and, and then I gave kind of a final final thoughts on communion. And as we looked at this body and blood of Jesus, it was broken, it was shed for us. I just told our church our group to never, never lose sight of this. What Jesus did for you. Our, our tour guide there at the, the tomb was this lovely woman from Vancouver, British Columbia. There on a, on a two month uh, job volunteering. Originally from Ireland, so her thick Irish Canadian brogue told us something that is a good reminder. That when Jesus went to the cross, it wasn't the Romans and it wasn't the Jews that, that killed him. It was him that gave himself for us. It was him that gave up his spirit. It was him that in the spite of, of, of praying, God, let this cup pass from me. Stuck true to God. Why? So that we could have life. He went to the cross and he did it for me and for you. He went to the tomb for me and for you and he rose from the grave for me and for you so we could walk with God. So we could experience restoration take a piece of bread and a cup of juice and yes, these are symbols, but there's so much more than just symbols. There's so much more than just a cracker and a little bit of grape juice. It's the body, the blood, and it's life. And it was so neat to hear from Luke and think about the work that his crew is doing in Japan. This is a moment in communion that we share with Christians all over the globe, all over the planet, taking communion right
I'm going to do some announcements before we close today. A um, few quick things real quick. If you've got your bulletin, make sure you're reading about the details. Uh, but we have three things we want to cover real quick. The first one is Crossroads Kids, the VBS starting next Monday. Um, all you have to do is make sure you get your kiddos, your grandkids, your kids, and anybody other kids, and they just have to be Crossroads Kids, get friends to sign up online, we, and they're going to start that next Monday. So um, check with Mark. Or Mark. Mark, you're still in charge of kids. Check with Matt and uh, make sure there's some uh, more volunteer places you can fill in and help out with uh, VBS. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We haven't done VBS for a little while, so we're going to have a great time with it. Okay, so make sure you sign up for that. Now, the second one is the Get Her Done. It's this Wednesday. Uh, we usually do it the first Wednesday of the month, but we have to get ready for VBS next week. So we need as many hands on deck as we can Wednesday night. We'll be here at 630 I'll have some snacks and drinks back here so Pam doesn't have to get all that stuff set up. And we'll divide out in groups. We're going to do some things around the church uh, to get some sprucing up done. But Matt's going to need some help setting up for VBS. And Brenda's going to need some help uh, setting up for the, uh, the float, for the parade. Which brings up the next one. Um, don't forget, Old Shawnee's Parade is next Saturday. Okay, for, and that is the third. Uh, we're going to get the float set up here. Uh, we're going to have the Crossroads Cruisers uh, riding and revving behind them. But we're going to need walkers and volunteers to hand out all the cups with the materials in that. So uh, if you look at the details in here, it tells you when to go, where you're supposed to meet down on Quivira and uh, Shawnee Mission Park and where we're going to be uh, for the parade. And then kind of tie in with that is the T-shirts. The You can see the sample out on Creepy Carl out in the foyer. Um, that's what we call them anyway. And if, if you're ever in the building by yourself and you walk by that mannequin, I guarantee you you're going to get scared at least six times a day. Whew, man, I'll tell you what, my heart. Um, he's got the T-shirt on that we're going to be uh, taking orders from starting next week. You can take a look at the design. And those aren't necessarily for the parade. Those are just to wear for Crossroads T-shirts. If you're going to walk in the parade next week, if you've got a Crossroads T-shirt, wear it. We like all the different colors in there. It's kind of fun. We don't have to have any one. And I'm sure there's still some better than bacon T-shirts out there. So um, make sure you bring that. Okay, so let's stand and let's dismiss. And then Ben's going to take us out with some music. Amen. Yes. Father, it's been good to be in your house today. We just ask that, Lord, we just take the message forward as we go out of this building and out of this place, as we go into our work and our home and on the streets, Lord, that we share the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we need to do, Lord. That's what you've asked us to do. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us with a church. And, Lord, now that we may take your message out and bless others. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. amen. You are dismissed. Have a great week. Thank you.